Every now and then, you discover that TV show you just can't stop thinking about. You read every shred of analysis you can find online. You beg your friends to start watching just so you've got someone else to talk about it with. You watch and re-watch every single episode, spotting all the little details and coming up with new theories. So, who wants to hear about my new obsession? Inside Number 9 is a British anthology series written by Steve Pemberton and Rhys Shearsmith, best known for The League of Gentlemen and Psychoville. Throughout the years, their work has been unique, bizarre, often managing to hit that sweet spot between comedy and horror. To say I'm a fan would be a bit of an understatement, as I could probably recite most of The League of Gentlemen sketches in my sleep. Yes, even Series 3. Pemberton and Shearsmith's latest venture uses a very simple format, each 30-minute episode takes place in a single setting, much like a one-act play, and is based inside or around a different number nine. This could be anything – a house, a dressing room, a train carriage, even a shoe. The story is played out by a small cast, usually including both writers, and often culminates in a devilish plot twist – some of the best I've seen in any medium, and these make for some intriguing second viewings. Why should you watch Inside Number 9? Because it has everything. Drama, humour, tragedy, suspense, and even some emotional moments that were enough to reduce me to tears. While the show is often billed as a comedy, or dark comedy to be precise, that isn't strictly true. The tone can shift dramatically at a moment's notice, revealing a disturbing truth that changes everything about the story we thought we were watching. And these are the episodes I'm going to talk about today. Be warned, this show gets dark, very dark at times, and no subject is taboo. While it never descends into cheap shock value or crass attempts at handling issues, themes such as suicide, incest, sexual assault and child abuse do feature in certain episodes. This might take the form of abstract supernatural horror or as the depraved deeds of seemingly normal individuals who turn out to be the real monsters. While the series also has its share of lighter moments and laugh-out-loud humour, just remember there's no guarantee of a happy ending. Overall, Number 9 is a masterclass in writing, performance and experimental storytelling, and I can't recommend it highly enough. The first four series are available on DVD, plus you might be able to find it on Netflix or BBC iPlayer depending on your location. If you're a fan of other anthologies such as Twilight Zone, Tales of the Unexpected or Black Mirror, then this is definitely one to watch. So, as you'll notice from the title, I've compiled a list of the nine most disturbing episodes of Inside Number 9. This time we'll be looking at my choices for numbers 9 through 6, and my top 5 will be revealed in part 2. I'd just like to point out a few things before we start. First, this is not a countdown of the most popular episodes, neither is it a list of my own personal favourites. In either case, the top spot would probably go to the 12 Days of Christine. These are what I consider to be the nine most disturbing episodes, from series 1 to series 4, and each one has left an impression on me in one way or another. I know it's a subjective topic, and I'm sure you all have your own opinions. Feel free to share them in the comments. Second, I will be talking about the endings. This video will discuss each chosen episode in detail, explaining what it accomplished and why it gave me the creeps. I'd hate to ruin a good plot twist for you, so I highly recommend watching the show before we go any further. However, if you don't have time to watch the entire thing, then check out the description below to see which episodes are included in this video. And as it's an anthology series, they can be watched in any order. Okay, so without further ado, here are the 9 most disturbing episodes of Inside Number 9. Number 9. Sardines. The first entry on our list just happens to be the very first episode, and what a great introduction it was, setting the tone with its irreverent comedy, absurd scenario and glimpse into the darker side of humanity. On this occasion, Number 9 is a family mansion, playing host to an engagement party. During a game of sardines, the guests all squeeze together in the wardrobe where awkwardness ensues and the tension rises. It turns out this closet contains more than a few skeletons. For those who've never played, sardines is a variation of hide and seek, where one player hides and everyone else tries to squash in beside them. It's a horrible game if you're claustrophobic, socially anxious or both. And just to clarify, sardines is a children's game not normally played by adults. This is weird, even for British people. 
As more characters enter the wardrobe, their secrets begin to emerge, and we start asking questions. How did Carol develop a fear of intimacy? Why did Stinky John suddenly stop washing? And why does Geraldine, aka Feed the Birds, start banging on about a scout jamboree that happened decades ago? By the end, we'll wish we never asked. Besides the overwhelming sense of claustrophobia, a common theme at number 9, sardines is disturbing because of the implications. Towards the end, we learn that Andrew, the father of the house, has been accused of terrible things. Andrew's defence that he was teaching the boy how to wash himself leaves little to the imagination. The tale concludes in a grim note as his accuser, now an adult, slowly locks the wardrobe door and prepares to set it ablaze. We don't know if he actually goes through with it, but it's a chilling image to end with. Watching the episode for a second time reveals even more about the characters' pasts. For instance, it's heavily implied that there were other victims of Andrew's abuse, including John. That would explain why he suddenly stopped washing and why he's still unable to look Andrew in the eye. Andrew's own son, Carol, also shows signs of emotional damage and makes many loaded statements throughout the episode. It's possible that Carol was also abused, or perhaps he witnessed something happening to his friends. Whatever the case, both John and Carol remain traumatised as adults and still flinch at the smell of carbolic soap. There's also a very brief mention of an older sibling who does not attend the party. Neither do her sons. Rebecca excuses their absence to Geraldine, but she's clearly uncomfortable and seems desperate to drop the subject. Why is that? Did Rebecca choose not to invite her sister, or did Caroline refuse to come? Are they concerned about letting Andrew near the boys, or did something already happen? While it's only a passing reference, this certainly got my attention the second time around. We also learn a lot about Ian, or Pip, to give him his real name. Pip's actions are premeditated. He carries lighter fluid, lies about his identity, and it was he who chose the cupboard as a hiding place, knowing it could be locked from the outside. It's also hinted that the abuse took place in the nearby bathroom, so the location might be symbolic for him. And how's this for foreshadowing? Early in the episode, Pip tells Rebecca his initials are R.I.P., as in the phrase, rest in peace. He says this knowing that she and her guests will shortly be dead. Pip has become so fixated on his revenge that he is prepared to kill innocent bystanders, including his childhood friends. But as he reminds himself while singing the sardine song, it's only a tin full of people. Number 8. Private View A group of strangers attend an exclusive art installation at the Number 9 Gallery. After hearing a message from the artist revealing that he died three years ago, the guests discover that they are being picked off and slaughtered one by one. As one character points out, it's all a bit Agatha Christie. Pemberton and Shearsmith claim their inspirations for this episode were Theatre of Blood, Dario Argento and the Giallo School of Italian Horror. In other words, things are about to get very violent and very messy. The murders in private view are stylized and elaborate, with many of them serving as ironic punishments. For instance, the smoker with the new lung is suffocated, and the alcoholic who received a liver transplant is killed by a bottle of spiked champagne. It's all part of the killer's motive, punishing the guests for their wicked lifestyles and reclaiming their transplanted organs, for which she considers them undeserving. These connections get a bit far-fetched, something the heart patient points out when he's accused of being a heartless critic. While some might see this as a weakness in the episode's writing, for me it only added to the demented logic of the killer. Jean Quinn, played by Fiona Shaw, was a fantastic villain, hamming up the thick Irish stereotype to the point of offensiveness before revealing her true colours. Her final scene is pure perfection, as she lovingly caresses her son's statue with blood-stained hands, then monologues while preparing to extract a man's heart. And yes, that's the same actress who played Aunt Petunia in the Harry Potter films. At least Harry only got locked in a cupboard. And it's a good thing it wasn't this one. What makes this episode disturbing? Well, it might have something to do with the crazy dinner lady cutting people open and sticking their organs in formaldehyde. Because, let's face it, we're all full of delicate, squishy material and we don't like to think of it being damaged or, worse, removed. Private View is full of bloody, visceral horror, including one particularly gruesome scene for anyone ice squeamish. 
quick aside, if human organ repossession holds some ghoulish appeal to you, and you also like musicals, you should check out Repo the Genetic Opera. It's gory, it's weird, and there's a review of it right here on my channel. Watching Private View for a second time allowed me to dig a little deeper into the mind of the killer. Jean isn't just murdering people, she's taking back the organs that once belonged to Elliot, almost as if she's trying to put her son back together. This paints a picture of someone who has completely lost their mind through grief. The same can be said of her efforts to complete Elliot's masterpiece. Jean could have used art to form an emotional connection to her late son, or as a healthy way to express the pain of bereavement. Instead, she takes creativity to a dark place with her theatrical murder spree, and worst of all, she's enjoying it. Look at how she toys with her victims, telling them she can hardly keep her child in one piece, or that she doesn't drink champagne because it really burns. You don't say. The real tragedy, apart from all the death, is that Jean has corrupted her beloved son's dying wish. Fragments should have been a joyful event, a celebration of Elliot's talent and the gift of life. Instead, his final exhibition is warped into a circus of death. While the final scene was a bit of a letdown in my opinion, Private View still earns the number 9 award for most killings in a single episode. Henry Portrait would be proud. Number 7. Seance Time A woman named Tina arrives at number 9 to take part in a seance, which is revealed to be a setup for a hidden camera show. We spend the rest of the episode with the cast and crew as they air their grievances and set up for the next prank. Meanwhile, our host Terry is confronted by a ghost from his past, Spirit of Little Boy. This episode is bookended with intense scenes of supernatural horror, both real and staged. The fake seance is played absolutely straight for the first five minutes, creating a sense of terror for the audience before it's revealed to be a prank. The real haunting, shown at the end of the episode, takes those scares to the next level. Both scenes are carefully constructed to build tension and fear, with audio and visual effects that are genuinely creepy. Between these moments, we watch the real horrors unfolding behind the camera. We've all heard that show business can bring out the worst in people, and the crew of Scaredy Cam take this to the extreme. One exception is Gemma, who's informed that she's in the wrong job, because she doesn't enjoy treating people like shit. The others are egotistical, amoral, and you might even say, egregious. Their personalities are shown at their very worst once they're inconvenienced by the death of an extra. What if Terry has his show cancelled again? What if Amanda can't get the wig back into storage? And what if Anne doesn't get something to eat before the theatre? While they're bickering over their own selfish concerns, a man lies dead on set, and not one person has bothered to learn his name. Of course, that's not the only untimely death linked to Scaredy Cam. Madame Talbot's seance may be fake, but that doesn't stop the spirit of little boy from making itself known. The ghost appears to be very young, carrying a teddy bear and repeatedly asking, where's mummy? In life, the boy had been the victim of a scaredy cam prank, during which he got so terrified that he wet his pants on live TV. After the clip went viral and the humiliation became too much, the boy took his own life by jumping in a river. His ghost returns to get revenge on Scaredy Cam's host, who's left dripping in pure poetic justice. As well as, you know, other stuff. But here's the thing. While we might enjoy seeing Terry get his comeuppance, it'd be wrong to say that he alone is responsible for the child's death. After all, millions of people watched that clip, and few of them might have considered how the child was affected afterwards. Scaredy Cam is a fictitious show, of course, but it allows Number 9 to turn its lens on the medium of television and its audience. TV often encourages us to accept cruelty as a form of entertainment. We laugh as a stranger is humiliated on screen, then forget about it as soon as we change the channel. All too often, we fail to realise that these are real people, with real lives, suffering very real consequences. The way we treat people on television has recently been called into question, and I'd say rightfully so. On my second viewing of Seance Time, I noticed a strong connection between the boy's ghost and the actor who plays Blue Demon Dwarf. For one thing, he was originally hired to play Spirit of Little Boy. This is acknowledged when the real spirit possesses his corpse to speak to Terry. The actor's skin is painted blue, just as the boy's skin would have turned blue from drowning. 
At one point, the actor's name is mistakenly thought to be Tom, which also happened to be the name of the boy's teddy bear. But maybe that's a bit of a stretch. Speaking of names, you may have noticed that neither of these characters seems to have one. Incidentally, the actor is called Clive and the boy's name is William, but you wouldn't know that unless you looked it up online or checked the credits. This reiterates the episode's central theme of dehumanisation. As far as Terry and his audience are concerned, these were just two nameless entities, the warm prop and the pissing boy. In reality, these were two innocent lives, cut tragically short, all for the sake of a stupid bit of telly. Number 6. Cold Comfort We open with a typical day at the comfort support line. Andy, a new volunteer, sets up in booth number 9, where he takes a call from Chloe, a troubled teen who tells him she's taken an overdose. Andy's left shaken after the phone call, but he hasn't heard the last from Chloe. The crisis helpline was an inspired setting, and that ringing phone soon becomes a source of dread. The next caller might be some poor desperate soul whose life hangs in the balance, or just another wanker. And yes, apparently those sex calls do happen. On the other hand, no pun intended, the person on the phone might be Andy's mystery stalker, back to torment him once again. Either way, he has no choice but to take that call. Cold Comfort has an unusual visual gimmick. Each scene plays out in real time across multiple surveillance cameras. You can actually see the actors walking from one feed to another. This heightens the feeling of paranoia as the story develops, especially once you realise the calls might be coming from inside the building. It even shows us Andy's hoax caller hiding in plain sight, though it's all too easy to miss this on the first viewing. The CCTV style really comes into its own during Andy's first phone call with Chloe. The camera remains static and the conversation plays out in one long, unbroken take, with no edits, distractions or cutaways. Just like Andy, the viewer is held hostage and we're forced to sit and listen helplessly as a young girl appears to end her life. It all makes for a highly dramatic and deeply uncomfortable watch. The first time I saw this scene, I actually had to pause the episode and take a moment before carrying on. The idea of talking to someone who wants to die and not knowing how to help them just felt a bit too real. Honestly, I was relieved when Chloe called for the second time because it meant that she was still alive. Demented done possibly dangerous, but still alive. In the end, Chloe wasn't who she said she was, but it made me wonder, how realistic was that conversation with Andy? Would things play out that way in real life? The following was taken from an AMA with the Reddit user Secret Samaritan. We've had live suicides on the phone. There's no sugarcoating it, life can be grim. But we have no idea who they are unless they choose to tell us. If someone has chosen to spend their last moments on earth talking to us until they can talk no more, then we respect that decision. For anyone who wants to learn more, you can find links to the Samaritans homepage as well as the AMA in the description below. When I watched Cold Comfort for the second time, I noticed something strange going on with the audio. We know Reese Shearsmith's character was the one being Chloe, and it's not exactly the first time Reese has played a woman, but that's not his voice we hear during the first call. However, his voice does start to emerge over the course of the episode. This was achieved by having two performers for Chloe. One was Reese, and the other was an actress named Vicky Hall. Apparently the actors would listen to each other's takes, then re-record their lines until both had produced a near-identical tone of voice. The recordings were then mixed together, with Vicky being heard exclusively at first, until Reese's voice gradually starts bleeding through. This effect was so subtle that I completely missed it the first time around. Finally, let's talk about George, the man who pretends to be a suicidal teen. We know it's not the first time he's done something like this, as his calls to Andy's predecessor, Victoria, caused her to have a nervous breakdown. We see he's prone to violent outbursts when he attacks Liz, and how he manages to manipulate his way out of trouble, forcing his victims to take the fall. Worst of all, his actions have resulted in the deaths of at least two people the cat lady who killed herself after calling the helpline, and Andy, who's about to be murdered right before the credits. Bear in mind, these are just the crimes we know George has committed, and mostly gotten away with. 
Who knows how many more lives he's ruined over the past 27 years? I guess what Liz said rings true. The volunteers are more fucked up than the people ringing in. So those are my entries so far in the nine most disturbing episodes of Inside Number 9. What do you think? Any thoughts on which episode deserves the number one slot? Nearly everyone I ask has a different answer, so I'd love to hear from you all. Leave your comments below, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell if you want to hear my top five. Till then, good night, sleep tight, and don't let the bugger bite you.